So we spent a little time with the SIR models of disease modeling, where we have a population of people, we've split them into susceptible, infected, and recovered, and we use different rates to talk about how they move between these different categories. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna expand this into the world of programming, into the world of Python. I know we did a little bit of math before in order to create uh, the effective contact rate and the removal rate, but now we're actually going to build a model. So there are two different ways that you can build models in Python uh, in when it comes down to disease modeling. And one of them requires differential equations, uh, which I have never done in my life, but hey, look at this. I stole some code that allows me to do it. So the differential equation styles are deterministic models. These are models where every single time you run the model, you're going to get the same result. So the thing that's important is all of your inputs. The other kind of models that exist are stochastic models, and those are based on randomness. The idea is you keep running these models again and again and again, and it gives you a distribution of maybe where things might go instead of giving you one specific number and one specific way things are going to turn out. But because we are wonderfully simple-minded, we are gonna stick with this. It's also much easier to program. So uh, I have a few links here, and the idea is that models are all terrible. Um, they're very, very confusing. They're always spitting out different numbers. All of the experts are disagreeing. Uh, you can give a read through on these in order to kind of have a, a reader's view of why they're not good or not why they're not good, why they are, that's unfair to say, uh, why it is perhaps complicated to successfully judge what a model is saying. Uh, and now we're actually going to build a model so you can see how very small changes end up giving you very large differences. So what happens here uh, is the first thing we do is we import a few things. Um, this is the differential equations magic here. This is just for the data science stuff and matplotlib is for the plotting. Now, I did not write this code. I edited this code, I renamed a bunch of things, but I borrowed it from this website right here, uh, which is scipython.org. It is a simple Python explanation of uh, an SIR epidemic model. So I adjusted it, but there's a lot of different pages on the internet that basically have this exact same code because it's not actually that complicated. But I broke it down a little bit, renamed some variables. Um, if we look at this code right here, uh, beta, gamma, uh, we have DSDT, there's some derivatives there. It seems so crazy. You're like, oh, Soma, what are you doing? I don't understand what's happening. All you need to do, all you need to do is watch this video. I open it up to the part that is useful to you. Um, one day it might load. And it's a guy explaining step by step how you are going to use these equations in order to come to the results that we're gonna get. All we're concerned with personally is how effective contact rate and recovery rate end up creating these sorts of graphics. But if you wanna know the math behind it, it's honestly not that complicated, looks a little intimidating, but you'll be fine. Just watch this video, probably from the beginning, uh, but you will understand this easily. So uh, just as a reminder, uh, the important numbers that we're dealing with here are the effective contact rate and the recovery rate. So for example, 5% transmission rate and five contacts a day gives us an effective contact rate, the rate at which uh, someone who is infected will come in contact with someone who is uninfected and then give them the disease is 0.25. And the recovery rate is one over the number of days. So four day recovery period uh, is 0.25. Five. Um, now note that the effective contact rate 
assumes that the uninfected person is only meeting with people who are uh, not infected. So just bear that in mind. Okay, so this is a big, big, big chunk of code. I'm going to walk you through it just so you know what's going on here. So first, we set our effective contact rate and our recovery rate. Uh, I just plugged in 0.25 or 0.5. I did not do this math here. If you want to do this math here, that's totally fine. You could do 0.05 times 5. Delightful. Uh, and then we have the recovery rate of four days. We print out the R0. So the R0 is not very useful in terms of how the math works on this one. Um, it uses the effective contact rate and the recovery rate, but it's useful to know, so I'll print it out. Now what we do is we set up our population. I say we have 1,000 people in our population. We have zero people who have recovered, and then we have one person who is infected. So the people who are recovered cannot get the disease. The person who is infected uh, will one day end up hopefully becoming recovered. In order to compute the number of susceptible people, we say, hey, total population, let's subtract out the infected people, subtract out the recovered people, whoever's left over is susceptible. We now make a list of from 0 to 160, it's the number of days, and then we do some differential equations. You can ignore this chunk right here. You will not have to change this code. Uh, what comes out of this is the variables S and I and R. And what they each are is a list of the number of susceptible people on every day from 0 to 160, uh, the number of infected people on each one of those days, and the number of recovered people on each one of those days. I put that into a data frame, and then I plot it. So I'm going to shift enter here. It's going to say the R0 is 1. Now we talked about the R0 being 1 as a situation in which things don't get very crazy, in which one person passes it to one person, passes it to one person, and yeah, that's kind of what's happening here. So let me go back up and change this back to 0 0.5, what I had it as before. I'll give it another run, and there we go. This is a little bit more exciting. So we see infected people peak and then go back down Whereas over time, more and more people get the disease, but more and more people recover. So at its peak, we probably have, let's say, you know, 175 or so people who are infected all at the same time. And then some people who are susceptible, but don't get it within this time frame we're looking at. Along with the chart, if you look at DF, it actually gives you the list of here's the number of susceptible people, infected people, recovered people, and the day. So we can say, uh, see on day 159, we have just about zero infected people. Uh, we have about 797 people who have recovered and about 203 people who are still susceptible. Uh, because this infected number of people is so low, it's gonna be very, very difficult for them to infect anyone because basically no one is infected anymore. So the disease has successfully uh, more or less died out. Now. What you're going to be doing in this assignment with the questions down here is playing around with these numbers. The one important thing to pay attention to is if you play around with these numbers in certain ways, this code will break. So for example, right now, we just made these numbers up. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I am going to shift this into, let's say we have the flu. Do we talk about the flu here? Okay, so let's say we shift this to have an effective contact rate of 0.7 and a recovery rate of three days. If we run this code, we are gonna get a terrible, terrible error. It will have spat out your R0 is 2.1. So this is, you know, it's kind of bad, pretty bad. Um, but now we get an error so we cannot see our graphic and it's being very sad, it's freaking out on us. When stacked is true, each column must be either all positive or negative. 
negative dot infected contains both positive and negative values. If we look at this code here, we see at the end, the number of infected people has actually gone below zero. And sorry, that's just how it has to be. Uh, the way we are going to fix this is the problem is that we are using stacked area charts. Um, it's yelling at us and by saying that when stacked is true, each column is blah, 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 blah. Um, if we change stack true to stacked equals false, we no longer have our charts or our different areas stacking on top of one another, but we can still see what's going on. We see that little bump of infected people. We see the number of susceptible people drop, and we see the number of recovered people up, up, up. So if you get that error, that is the only thing you need to change. Um, you can also play around with these numbers uh, until they get something right. Down near the bottom, um, inside of the flattening the curve section, uh, we actually change up our deriv. So we have a new function called deriv adjusted. Let me explain that real quick. So up at the top, we have this thing that I kind of dismissed as being, oh, it's differential equations. So what this does is it takes in your susceptible, infected, and recovered people, uh, and then kind of examines how things are going to change based on the beta, which is your effective contact rate, and the gamma, which is your recovery rate. I could have changed those variable names, but these lines just got very, very long when I did it, so I skipped it. So basically, in this deriv code right here, your effective contact rate is always the same, and your recovery rate is always the same. What I do down here is I switch things up, and I say, look, beta, which is your effective contact rate, it is going to change. So right now, I'm saying that uh, on if the day is greater than 30, return the contact rate. Uh, if it's not greater than 30, still return the contact rate. So you can adjust this code right here to say after a certain day, maybe we have lockdown, so your contact rate drops by 10%, 20%, 90%, things like that. Because what's going to happen is you are going to be able to flatten the curve here, where you're going to have one infected arc and one infected with lockdown arc. And so you're going to be able to see what happens if you have lockdown, if maybe you remove lockdown, put lockdown back in place, and you can kind of experiment to see all of those charts, those flattening the curve graphics that you end up seeing all in the news or on Twitter at least. So um, that is the walkthrough of how this SIR modeling works and how to get around that one little bug. Just remember that this is just a normal data frame, so you can play with it just like a normal data frame. Uh, get averages, maxes, mins, slices, uh, check out certain days, things like that. All right, so uh, this model is a very simple model. Um, there are a lot of other models out there for uh, disease modeling. Um, even within the world of compartmental models, there are a million different kinds of models because you can take this SIR model, uh, you can add things like whether people are living or dying, maybe it's a very long term, maybe we're talking about 100 years as opposed to talking about uh, just you know 20 days or 50 days or 100 days. You can talk about people who get exposed, uh, who are not infectious, you can talk about people who are carriers, you can talk about people who have become infected, who then get removed and then go back actually to being susceptible again. There are 1 million models and they all have these hilariously complicated looking uh, descriptions of what goes into them. But if you are interested in how this stuff works, I definitely, definitely recommend taking a look at this video here. Uh, because once you look at this video here and you kind of can step through this code and then also what we're doing here, you might actually be able to implement those even if you've never used differential equations before or even if you've forgotten everything about like how calculus works and things like that. Uh, so hopefully you are now a disease modeling expert and you can go on Twitter 
and you can make all sorts of unfounded assumptions about what is going to happen as COVID spreads around the world. Oh, and one more thing. There's this really excellent uh, library. It's not an excellent library. I've never used it. It's just a library and it's called Epigrass. And I haven't used it, but what it does along with just saying, here's the R0, here's the simulation, here's what the spread is going to look like. It also builds in geography. So what it allows you to do is say, okay, I have a few different areas, a few different, let's say cities or a few different countries. And here's the connection between them. Here's the migration between each one of these. So instead of just saying, here is the R0 for our disease, you can say, here's what it looks like in this country, and then it's gonna to spread to this country and spread between these cities, and it just seems like a lot of fun. So every time you look at one of these models and you think either, oh, I'm amazing, I made a model, this is so cool, I predicted something, or you think, oh, this model doesn't take into effect X, Y, or Z, just know that we are using the simplest possible model. The SIR model is like modeling for dummies, but it's still, reasonably effective in describing how things might play out. And you'll see that once you hit the bonus down here and you start to play with lockdown. This was probably like all of my hours and hours and days spent researching how epidemiology works and how I can make this work in Python. Once I made this flattening the curve thing work, it was all worth it. So hopefully you work through all of this and then you flatten the curve and you are just as excited as me. All right, that's it.